Hello, hello, and welcome again to a Beatles program, which is called Things We Said Today. This is a weekly show in which we talk about what's going on in the world of the Beatles. Newswise, I'm Ken Michaels. I'm one of the two co-hosts for this show, and you might know me for another Beatles show that I host called Every Little Thing, heard around the country and around the world, and I'm being joined by my co-host, the man who writes for Beatles Examiner, Monkeys Examiner, Weird Al Yankovic Examiner. It's a wonder he has time for us. I probably being, think you're joking when, when, I, when you said Weird Al Yankovic, but that's not a joke, really. It, it is happening. But yeah, anyway. Well, I'm sure, I'm sure our guest knows all about that. Oh, okay. Thank you, Ken. Hello, everyone. <laughs> How are you doing today? I'm fine. How are you? I'm just great. We have a special guest with us on the phone from Hawaii. And it's not Todd Rundgren. That's a that's a first. <laughs> and it's not uh Jim Neighbors. Might be close to Jim know. Neighbors for all you know, but uh we have Dennis Alstrand with us. He is the author of a brand new book on Paul McCartney. Actually it's a Beatles and Paul McCartney book, and the the exact title is The Beatles and their revolutionary bass player. Let's welcome Dennis Allstrand to Things We Said Today. Oh, well, thank you for having me on, Steve and Ken. Ken and Steve. Great to have you here with us, Dennis. Uh, before we talk about uh, your book and all the uh, information that, uh, that, is, that you bring us in the book, uh, some news items that we're going to talk about, and Dennis, feel free to chime in on any of this. It's been a busy last okay. few days in particular because, for one thing, a brand new Paul McCartney song has just leaked out, and it's the song for the brand new video game called Destiny. And Steve, you and I, I know, both heard it, and Dennis has heard it. And uh, what do you think about it? I I, I really think it's it's un, it almost sounds like un, it's unlike anything he's done. I thought um, it's a very you know if you've heard video game music before, it's very much like that. It's, I wouldn't call it groundbreaking in that sense, but it's a beautiful song. Hmm. Um, it, it, he he did a, a very good job with this. What do you think, Ken? I like it a lot. I think it's a good mid-tempo song, really good vocals from Paul, a uh, great melody line, and it kind of reminds me somewhat uh, of Dance Till We're High from The Fireman, if you think about it. I've heard the song about mm -hmm. four or five times today. So uh, I really like the song a lot. I'm waiting to find out how exactly it's going to be released. But we do know that the video game should be coming out like any moment now. And I don't know how much we've heard about the video game, Steve, but it's my understanding that all the music that's in the video game was composed or at least was co-written by Paul. I, I looked that up a couple uh, when the... When the um uh, I did some research on it uh, when the word first broke on that, and honestly, I can't remember. I I don't think I think you're wrong, Ken. I don't think he did all the music, but I think but he he did a significant portion of it. I mean, obviously, you don't hire somebody like Paul McCartney to to do your music and not use a lot of it. But I I don't think he's got all the music in the game. At least I'm not I'm not sure of that though. Okay, because what for but, what I found out about this, he co-wrote the score. Um, with uh, Bungie's in-house composer. Um, actually, mm -hmm. there's two of them. Uh, the names are Marty Marty O'Donnell and Mike Salvatore. Right, right. That's Yeah, that's what I was referring to, that, that there are other people involved in the score besides McCartney. Okay, but, but I, I thought um, that all the music that's used in the game itself was at least co-written with Paul and these other people. Mm -hmm. That's my understanding. I could be wrong, but... I think you're right there. I, like I said, I hadn't. I remember looking up the information um, uh, and the interviews online uh, about this, and and you know, and there were other people that that worked on the music of the game besides McCartney. But yeah, I mean, is you know, obviously when you use somebody like McCartney, you know, he gets a big, you know, gets a big chunk. He pretty much calls the shots as far as what he wants to do. So. Hmm. Yeah, no, I think it's a great song, Dennis. What do you think? Well, I was struck like this. Uh, just someone sent it to me in uh, a Facebook message. I listened to it, and I, I haven't been struck struck by a McCartney song that well since uh, Tug of War, which I loved. 
And uh, this time I kind of had the same feeling. Like, this is fantastic. Mm -hmm. I love love that new song. What is it that that makes you like it so much? I mean, when you just said since Tug of War, that's a long time ago now. I tend to analyze songs when I hear them, and this time I was unable to. I just was kind of bowled over by great feeling, great music, great sound. I couldn't tell you anything about it or what it means or what he sings, just bowled over. Hmm. So when that happens, I get pretty excited about it. Do you go by first instinct a lot? No. Usually it takes me a while to like a song, like the last couple of hits that he had I didn't really care for the first couple of times mm -hmm. then it really grew on me like new I didn't really care for it the first time but now I think it's a fantastic song all right well we're waiting to hear exactly how it's going to be released at least the audio part and then there's other news uh, first of all I, I don't know if you know about this Steve but um, I just saw posted online the newer version of this guitar can't keep from crying which is in the uh, Apple Years box set from George Harrison, and mm -hmm. I just heard it, and it sounds really good. Yeah, I think I I think I posted the video a little while ago, but yeah, I, I haven't had a chance to listen to it yet. I I will listen to it sometime tonight, though. I take I take a listen to it. Too. Yeah, for anyone that doesn't know, George uh, made a, a recording of the song in 1992 for Dave Stewart, and unbeknownst to us, till we found out about uh, the box set. They updated that recording, and they have Ringo drumming on it, and Danny Harrison is uh, helping out on mm. guitar. So, um, yeah, it definitely sounds a little bit more modern in there. So uh, it's By the nice way, another, to have that. another very quick news item, the Los Angeles George Harrison benefit is sold out. So unless they come up with other tickets, anybody who doesn't have a ticket is is pretty much out of luck. And I know... At least one person who has messaged me, really desperate, trying to get get into that, but um, it is apparently sold out. Mm. So. Well, I expected that to happen. <laughs> I expected it to, I, with all those people playing. Uh -huh. Sure. Yeah. Sure. And uh, anyway, it, did you notice uh, Danny Harrison's quote that he put on Facebook on the new number two? Just how excited he is, not only about the box set, but also because of this concert because he said he's going to have a chance to do songs that he didn't do in the concert for George. Right. So what intrigues me most about all of this with Danny is that if you think back to the concert for George, we're looking at uh, 2002, and Danny then was, let's see, 24 years old. So it is now 12 years later. He has all this experience under his belt being in the new number two and all the other work he's done with Fistful of Mercy. He's been on stage mm -hmm. quite a lot, so he's got so much more um, experience, and I'm sure confidence in himself, and it'd be very interesting to hear him do these songs and sing these songs, too, because he didn't get to sing lead right. on. I recently picked up the Blu-ray of Concert for George, and boy, is that that is really, really nice. Really, really nice. Well, apart from being a great concert, it's such a tearjerker. Oh, yes, that that that, too. Yeah. That too. Um you can't watch especially the end of that thing and and uh I mean I remember seeing it in the theater and hearing hearing sniffles go through the theater. It was you couldn't couldn't uh help that. Yeah. For sure. Well, I couldn't go through watching so. that without myself crying any time I watch it, so I think out. it's the the best tribute concert I've ever seen. I think it is. Nothing really close. Yeah. There's one more thing I wanted to bring up. <laughs> and that is this uh, this new Paul McCartney tribute album, which is coming out in November, which has been mm -hmm. mentioned for years now, and it always gets postponed. And now they have an official release date of November the 18th for it. It's got a lot of right. artists on there, from Brian Wilson to Billy Joel to uh, Alice Cooper, all doing Paul McCartney songs, Beatles and solo. And they have a video that's leaked out, of um, The Cure, and they're doing Hello, Goodbye, and James McCartney is on it. So right. you can actually watch that online, too. I, I, I put it in the story I wrote about this yesterday. And actually, I saw a great Facebook comment. Somebody goes, that looks like Paul McCartney. <laughs> <laughs> well... Well, what but, do you think? Yeah, you know, I got to say, I didn't think that song was all that great. I, 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 that didn't floor me all that much. I'm anxious to hear some of the others. One of the ones that actually I'd love to hear is uh, Willie Nelson doing "Yesterday." I can just hear Willie Nelson singing that now. Mm. You know, 
Actually, there's one so. there's one song on the list that I already have in my head. <laughs> I've already heard the Which recording. Um, Smokey Robinson doing so bad. I mean, that is so natural mm. for him to do that song. I could hear that in a heartbeat doing that song. Yeah, I I, I really I really did not that video all that intriguing. I'm uh, um, I'm more anxious to hear some of the other stuff than that. Okay. Well, there's a lot of great artists on that compilation. And I, oh, I'm yeah. really looking oh, forward yeah. to hearing that. There's this, uh, the Ronnie Spector and the uh, Darlene Love tracks will be from the bonus album, which I assume will be the part of the Amazon version because the Amazon's going to have a uh, um, an exclusive, so I assume they'll have the third disc. But that that should be interesting. Okay, Dennis, do you follow Beatle covers at all or solo Beatle covers? I have. Not aware of a whole lot of them, other than the you know the real famous ones like "God Gets in My Life," "Earth, Wind, and Fire," etc. Mm. Like that. These ones that you're mentioning, I've never even heard of, or even the tribute the tribute album. I need to be brushed up. <laughs> All right. Well, one thing you don't need any brushing up on is uh, your knowledge of the Beatles and, and also of Paul as a bass player, which is what the focus is on in your in your new book. Before we talk about that, why don't you uh-huh. give the folks a little background on yourself? I know that you play the bass. Tell us more about uh, you know, your your history, the work that you've done prior to this book. Okay. Um, I have been playing bass since 1969, but I also, in true McCartney fashion, and uh, probably because of him, learned to play piano really well and I'm a guitar player, uh, used to play drums. Because, And the reason is that it's best if you write a song to be able to play what you want to play because it's kind of hard to get other people to do it right. Unless you're Paul McCartney, you can push it, you know. Uh, so I've done that for years. Uh, I really enjoy the recording studio, and it, I've been in the studio over here in Hawaii a number of times uh, like that. And uh, having written this book now, uh, that, that's my new line of pursuit is being a writer. That's what I'm enjoying even more than playing. Mm-hmm. All right. Have you made a living as a musician most of your life? Only for a couple of years, quite a while ago. And then as I started to raise up through the ranks of success, and I read a lot about a band's a lot about bands that had made it. I realized it'd be a lot more fun if I didn't get, become successful, and that's <laughs> that's what I did. Kind of just stayed in the clubs and have enjoyed playing a lot more because of that. Okay, Steve. Well, Dennis and I actually have a history because before Dennis, well before Dennis's book, Dennis contributed a lengthy essay on Paul McCartney as a bass player to my uh, Abbey Road Beatles page website, which is it's still there. But I remember, you know, looking at reading Dennis's um, analysis of Paul, you know, years ago, and it was it was fantastic. It really was. I'm glad that the book is, you know, you've you've lengthened it into the book and you've you know expanded it now. I'm, you know, that's really great. Very happy that you did that. Hmm. So. Right. What happened was that um, someone did suggest that I make a book out of it. And I, I got a book that's just about McCartney's bass playing in the Beatle days. And it was, it just felt incomplete to me to only talk about one aspect of the Beatles recording because you can just talk about a bass line, but it's locked in with the drums and it counters what the piano and the guitar is doing. So that's why I expanded it from McCartney's bass playing to a, a Beatle story with a focus on his playing. Hmm. Okay, that's one thing I wanted to bring up because one of the things I appreciate about the book is that it's also an analysis of the Beatles songs and what each Beatle brings to the table with each song. What I found most interesting, and this is just my interest in the Beatles always always grows, you know, every single day, uh, but you you analyze each song and it sounds from the way that you approach each song that every part has a purpose to it and that every part is very well thought out. You bring up the tension in a song and build-ups in a song. And I'm wondering, because so often I've heard Paul McCartney say that he and John would write a song and then they'd go to the studio and George and Ringo wouldn't even know the song and they'd have to develop the song very quickly. You know, they had to flesh it out, like in a number of hours. So, if anything... It makes me think that so many of these songs, especially the early ones, the ones that John and, and Paul wrote together, a lot of that was very spontaneous. It took a while. Even if you're talking about songs where you have 10 to 15 takes before they got it right, that's still very fast to learn a song and to get it right. Mm-hmm. 
No, it's 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 absolutely true, and I pointed out a number of times in the book that they had very little, amazingly small amount of time in the studio. They would travel around the country, England, zip down the two-hour, you know, big long drive down to London, record a bunch of songs and go out. But I think that's even more impressive in the early days because they may have not have known exactly what they're going to do, but they played so well together and they knew each other so well already that they could just feel a song and feel what would drive a song. Like, say, if you take a song like Please, Please Me, they spent a lot of time on that one uh, very clearly because that was their make-or-break song. If if that song had not, that was their second release, and if that song had not uh, made it, there would probably be no Lennon McCartney today. So there were a lot of songs that they spent a lot of time on uh, in the early days. They had to put them together quickly, but look how well they did it. Just awesome. Yeah. Makes you appreciate them even more. Sure does. When you know that they had so little time, Steve. Dennis, what was the? What would you say um, when you're talking about? Um, please, please me. And it was, what was the next turning point for them after "Please, Please Me"? Obviously, that was a big one. What well, was, that was what huge. Was in the, because the one before "Please, Please Me" didn't really. It was number seventeen, I think. "Please, Please Me" was number one based on the chart. So you, you have a million one-hit wonders, and the Beatles could have been that. George Martin knew that they could be that. So their next song was uh, Love Me Do. The next song was From Me to You. From Me to You. I'm not a huge fan of it, but it's a it's a fun Beatles song. It, I, that seems like a song that they probably knocked out in the studio pretty quickly, but it did go to number one, and they, with that, uh, established themselves, Lennon McCartney as songwriters and the Beatles as a hit-making machine that just didn't stop. And... Uh, like to talk about that at some point there, the machine like capability they had of recording incredible sound of music. Hmm. But I would say uh, you know, that that next song for me to you was the next turning point just because it solidified their success. Yeah, a couple things I wanted to, to bring up. Um there's a quote in here in your book. This is at the time when it was decided that Paul would become the bass player in the group, and as we all know, Paul didn't want to be the bass player. None of them wanted to play bass. Right. But you write in here, in the end, they decided to move the best lead guitarist of the lot over, and Paul <laughs> McCartney became yeah. the first bass-playing front man. Are you saying that Paul McCartney is a better lead guitarist than George Harrison? Yes. Yes, I am. I am saying that. Um, especially in, I would say, in the early days, yes, he was. I, I really think... Uh, and I know that George fans don't like this, but I, I think if you listen to his solos on the rock and roll stuff, in the early days, I'm trying to quantify this, <laughs> I think his stuff was wanting a little bit. It just was not a very smooth thing for George Harrison to play rock and roll guitar. Uh, when he started getting into the uh, Memphis-style guitar, like Chet Atkins style, or uh, Chuck Berry on Roll Over Beethoven, he was fantastic. And as years gone by, he became a great guitarist and the solo on something is maybe the best uh, solo on in the Beatles but I think in in those days when you go back to 1961 when McCartney took over I think he was the best one it's a pretty bold statement there to make. I said it <laughs> <laughs> well I think you'll have a lot of people who might disagree with you I mean Paul is, is a great musician overall in, in every instrument that, that he plays and there's no doubt about it you can pick a lot of Great lead guitar parts, especially Taxman, which I love so much. Yeah. I mean, the, the the biting lead guitar sound there, and and so many other songs where he did play lead. But uh, you know, George Harrison came up with some of the most memorable guitar solos, and uh, you know, just what was right for the Beatles. So I think some people might question that that comment right there. Oh sure, and it's just opinion. That's all it is. Uh, you know, George had great solos. I just think again in the early days that his rock and roll solos were were lacking a little bit where uh McCartney then was a was a pretty good guitar player. You know, it turned out, look how it turned out though. I mean, uh uh Paul on bass, George on guitar, we can't argue with that. Mm. Mm -hmm. Not at all. Steve? Yes, not to jump ahead. Well, I am going to jump ahead. One of the songs I was <laughs> looking for I'd, your opinion in the book on was getting better because I think the bass line on that is absolutely brilliant. And to my surprise, you really didn't say very much about getting better. Uh, was there a reason for that? Is that not uh, a song that you think was 
very significant or oh no not at all i love getting better and i love that wild bass part that he does uh you know that thing um uh, mm-hmm. the main thing was i didn't want to talk about every song you know i don't want to cover every song so i would pick an album and just go through and pick maybe six songs that i think really were something that cried out for me to talk about them uh if getting better got a short strip it's not because i don't like it i love that song I like uh, John and Paul's double harmony, you know, two-part harmony on the verses. I get the feeling John Lennon wrote the lyrics to the verses. It sounds like more his style. The guitar piano overlay at the start of the song, everything. Also yeah, interesting definitely. about that song is the is the fact that at the start they have a very strong piano guitar part, and at the end they're playing the same part with just a guitar much lighter, and it gives it an interesting aspect, don't you guys think? You know, instead of bam, bam, it's more like bling, 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 like that, you know. Mm-hmm. I just, I, 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 that bass line, though, where he, where he runs down the, you know, uh, in the middle of the song has always, I mean, I remember hearing that in mono when I got my first vinyl copy and, and, you know, sitting there just being intrigued by that, the way he did that. And, uh, that's why, I mean, I, that, uh, in fact, recently I think I was messing around with uh, Rock Band, and and of course I, that was the song I picked out, which was really kind of funny. <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean that's just it, it, it's just a wonderful song. Uh, uh, True, and I think the bass playing well, the only song it, of course doesn't play on Within You Without You, but that entire Sgt. Pepper album, you could pick any of those songs and talk about great bass playing because he did it separately from the. Recordings. He was able to think about the parts and work on them. Right. That worked really well. Right. And he must have been the first bass player ever to have that uh, possibility. Right. Oh yeah. And there's no question that that he expanded the frontier for bass playing. There's no question about that. Sure did. Dennis, for um, one of the challenges I think that you probably would have with with a book like this is that there are a lot of people out there that are not technical. So in order to word this in such a way that for, you know, the lay person to understand, I think one of the things that's very important to know about Paul as a bass player and in relation to the Beatles music are the different basses that he played, going from the Hofner to the Rickenbacker and then the Yamaha. Tell us what the difference is in the sounds of the guitars, how much that played into the overall sound and the effect on Beatles records. And, you know, just how important was it when he would use a Rickenbacker instead of a Hofner? Could you achieve the exact same sounds? Oh. You know, explain for, for our listeners who may not know all that much about that. I'll be glad to. And um, I'm going to make the Rickenbacker is going to sound better than the Hofner. Uh, it's much more easy to record with it. The, when he, his first years with the Hofner, it's his famous bass. He still uses the same one that he did in his Beatles days. Uh, it sounds way better now, but uh, there was a difficulty with recording the Hofner. It's a hollow body bass. It's very light, and in, when it goes into the recording itself, it's not real solid and, and punchy. It's more of a thump, thump, thump kind of bass sound. Mm-hmm. It's also short scale, which means that the neck is smaller. So it, uh, interestingly, what I've found with short scale basses is that it uh, allows your fingers just to play faster. You know, you don't. You don't settle into a rhythm as easily. Uh, the first time we heard the Rickenbacker bass by the Beatles was when uh, Paperback Writer was released. And I just was knocked out by that. Um, mm. We now have the Rickenbacker, which is solid body, which means full wood. It's not empty inside. Uh, it's got better electronics. It's got a longer neck, which keeps McCartney, uh, as he said, it sits him down and makes him play bass. Uh, it sounds better on record. And it's, uh, he always used, he always used flat wound strings, which for, which means that the sound is softer. It's not ringy. And on the Rickenbacker, he used it as well, but he got a nice trebly sound with that. The other bass that he used in, uh, in the Beatles was a Fender bass on the White Album a lot. And it was, uh, if you listen to the bass playing on Wild My Guitar Gently Weeps, some people and I who've kind of put together a study of this are, positive that that is the Fender bass, and it's a really nice sound. It's very trebly, it's very full, uh, engineered by uh, Ken Scott, who you interviewed, <laughs> Ken, mm-hmm. but uh, 
the, F- the Fender bass is a fantastic sounding bass, and he, through the end of the Beatle days, aside from Let It Be, stuck with his uh, two solid body basses. For Let It Be, being in the movie and being on, you know, video, uh, he uh, went back to his Hoffner bass. And uh, I'd like to make it clear that I'm not knocking the Hoffner bass. It sounds great, uh, especially now because it's been intonated. You know, the neck has been adjusted. My preference is the solid body Rickenbacker that he played. Um, in recent years, he's been playing only the Hoffner in concert. And right. a lot of that, as, as Paul has explained, is that Elvis Costello asked him to do that, to bring it back. And I know that Paul said that he likes to play it because it's lighter. So it's a lot easier on the back, I'm sure. But um, it would oh, be nice yeah. to see him bring back the Rickenbacker or a Fender. I loved it. Uh, and when The earlier times when I saw him around, the, around 1990 or so, he was playing his wall five-string bass, which is very deep sounding. And then, for a middle section in the middle, he brought out his Hofner, and it was it was pretty incredible to watch him playing his Hofner. Uh, back in the Wings Over America tour, he had his uh, Rickenbacker on, and that was just great sounding. So now he's back with his Hofner. It sounds great live. I understand, and uh, I'm glad he's doing it because it, it's like he says, it's like Charlie Chaplin. You expect to see his cane and hat, you know. Mm-hmm. Now you expect to see Paul McCartney's with his Hoffner. Right. Steve? Well, that, that actually leads me to, to uh, uh, a kind of a follow-up. Is he using older instru- the, the original instruments, the older instruments, or is he, has he got more modern versions of the instruments that he's using now? The Hoffner is the same one that he used uh, beginning in, I think, 1963. If you look at the photos, the real early ones show his pickups real close together. And then around 63 or so, he upgraded to a later model that has pickups further apart, and that's the one, the exact one that he's using now. In fact, I think he still has a set list from 1966 taped to it, you know, the Beatles' last tour. Right. Probably yeah. the Candlestick show. <laughs> yeah, yeah, maybe. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, of course. So you saw that uh, that same base there at Candlestick Park recently, both of you guys. Right. Yep. That's, that's yep. the one he always uses now. Yeah, that's the one. Anyway, um, I wanted to bring up something that I think is a is a very interesting aspect about Paul's bass playing, and I'm and I'm glad that you brought up this subject in the book, which is that there are a lot of people who feel that Paul does his best bass playing when it's not on his own songs, when he's playing the bass for yeah. John's songs or for George's songs. You wanna you wanna say how you feel about that? You go into it in the book very well, but for this interview how how do you feel about that particular issue oh i'll be glad to and i hope my enthusiasm over this doesn't bubble over too much i love this subject uh john lennon said in his playboy interview that he felt like uh it was sabotage or something like that when it, when it was his turn to do a song the beatles would loosen up and so i started looking into this and i started listening to mccartney playing on his own songs and for his own songs he was very clear well in advance, I, I think before he walked into the studio, he knew what he wanted everyone to play. It's pretty well known that he directed a lot of the parts. You know, he t- would tell George Harrison exactly what to do and Ringo and John, and then uh, it would become exactly what he wanted. For John Lennon, and there's no knock and Paul there. I mean, these songs are fantastic. Listen to Revolver and Sgt. Pepper. Those are what he wanted, and they're fantastic songs. John Lennon was more the kind of guy who said, I, I got this song. What do you guys think? And it's pretty clear that McCartney's bass playing, some examples are uh, Something by George, Come Together by John. His bass playing is just more loose and fun, and it's uh, around the neck a little bit more. It's uh, It still lifts the song. Every Beatle always recorded specifically for the song. But Paul has a great time on the other guy's songs. You know, Paul and jo- uh, John and George especially, uh it lists quite a few examples where the, the bass playing is loose and unhindered hmm. on their songs. Oh, I don't see it as sabotage at all. I don't think that McCartney was saying I'm going to make his song sound bad because what song by John Lennon and the Beatles sounds bad? I mean, uh, the, the bass parts, the bass part to come together is, uh, it's, it's like the whole song is based around that, that bass line. Uh, Stanley Clark was, you know, inspired by that bass line to know that the bass could run the song. And so it's not sabotage. He just was making John's song sound good, and he knew how to do that, that's for sure. 
Yeah. I totally agree. I think other songs, like especially the the bass line in Hey Bulldog, that is a wicked bass line oh, right yeah. there. And <laughs> it is nice, man. as you pointed out in the book, I Want You, She's So Heavy is one of the best bass lines, I think, ever. <laughs> oh, oh, and uh, he's just nuts on that song. He just, he don't, for once, he allowed himself to completely go free. And if you you hear the version on the Love album, you can really hear him even more. Uh, yeah, fantastic bass playing on that song. Just wild man, Paul McCartney. <laughs> so you think it's... What it's, a great song. You think that when it comes to his own songs, he's so wrapped up in the song and the fact that it's his own composition, and there are times when he's playing other instruments besides the bass, that maybe he doesn't have enough time, uh, or he's more tense with his yeah. own songs? I don't, I don't know if he's more tense. That may be, because he knows that he has to push the songs on the others, and you hear that a lot in the uh, bootlegs and stuff where he's going, all right, we're doing your song, John, but hey, we'll just do mine now, that kind of stuff. But you make a great point, Ken, that uh, on his own songs, he's thinking about the guitar, he's thinking about the keyboard, the piano, organ, or whatever, and uh, the bass and what the drums are going to do. He's thinking about everything, how it'll fit into one piece. Mm -hmm. So he wasn't free to just experiment with it, I don't think. Very interesting. And uh, what I noticed on... Uh, the uh, Creation in the Backyard, was that the album? Chaos and Creation in the Backyard. I noticed on that album that he was loosening up a lot in his recording and his what, is, what he was playing on his recordings. It seemed to be a lot looser, so maybe he was allowing himself more freedom and time. Hmm. Okay. Anyway, that's a great subject. I'm glad you brought that up. <laughs> I had to. <laughs> um, I was going to ask, Dennis, if you can, I don't know if you can if you can do this in a short answer or not, but how would you characterize the evolution of his bass playing from the early days. Obviously, you know, at the very beginning, he, there really wasn't, I mean, he was just basically there trying to, you know, fill underneath, you know, as he should have. When does his evolution, uh, when does his bass playing start to turn to the dynamic, you know, where he became, where he really started to become the, you know, the genius bass player that everybody knows him as now? I would say 1966 when uh, they started working on Revolver and the Paperback Writer and Rain singles. But I'd like to point out quickly, and I mentioned this in the book too, that the very first session that he did, which was, you know, with Tony Sheridan, mm -hmm. Ain't She Sweet, he was already a really good bass player, and he'd only been the bass player for about a month and a half. He was really good on that, and we could go into how he does the you know counter to the rest of the band and stuff. McCartney and, and all the Beatles brought a great sense of fun to the, the recordings even then. And this is just a little knockoff session in Germany uh, in 61, H.E. Sweet, and those songs. But you have the uh, the rest of the Beatles playing very staccato, Pete Bess and Lennon with their bump, bump, bump kind of thing. Uh, McCartney countered that with a, a legato smoother and more lo holding notes longer than everyone else line. It's not something you would really notice or think about until you kind of start thinking about how he's playing very differently than, than the rest of the band. He's kind of leading the song in that way. Lennon even is singing in short little stabbing words, but McCartney's bass parts are looser and uh, fuller. So here again with, with the song that John is singing, Paul is having a lot of fun. On this same subject, I've always found that if you listen very carefully to the bass playing in My Bonnie... I mean, Paul's fingering is all over the place there, oh. and you know, he is, it, yeah, he's, he's he's wild. I'd have to I'd have to think that even though he was only officially the bass player for a few months at that point, he must have dabbled in it somewhat in the previous he must years. Have. Yeah, you can't become that can't good get that, that fast. Good that fast. Yeah, <laughs> I agree. And uh, a couple of things happened in '66, and back to that part. One was. He started using his Rickenbacker bass, which really made him a whole new bass player, a whole different guy. Actually, he used a little bit on Rubber Soul, but in 66 on Revolver, he used it exclusively. Uh, and also, they had a new engineer. Uh, Jeff Emmerich took over from Norman Smith, and he had a lot of different ideas about how to record the bass as well as other instruments. At the same time, uh, a third thing that happened was that they were learning how to make records with louder bass. They always wanted the bass louder, but now they finally figured out how to do it in a way that wouldn't cause those little cheap record players that we all had. The styluses would jump out of the groove with too much bass, but they 
worked it all out somehow in 1966. So that was his big turning point. And what a huge one that was. Well, let me ask, let me ask one follow up. What happened after the Beatles broke up? Did he continue to evolve? Uh, um, did he, did he um, add any more techniques or any any new techniques to his to his repertoire then? I didn't think so. In fact, I lost a lot of interest in his bass playing until uh, "Silly Love Songs" of all songs. It was McCartney was back in my mind. There was a great <laughs> if you remember the bass line on that song. Then I went and saw that Wings Over America tour, and I s- stood there slack jawed, listening to that incredible bass playing through that whole concert, and it's still there to be heard on that album. He was playing in a way that I've never heard a bass player play. He did a. Uh, do you remember the song Soily that he closes the show with? Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. He, t- he mentions something about a Tommy gun, and he does this bass line. He goes. And I've tried to figure that line out, and I've never been able to do it. Just. Uh, he went back to being a great bass player by then. Well, I, I've always loved Soily. It's one of my favorite rockers. And definitely on the Wings Over America uh, album, they made sure that the bass was mixed hot on that release. <laughs> oh, and yeah. I, th- I think it benefits him. Me. Yeah. But if you go through Paul's solo career, there are moments when he delivers some really great bass lines. But my question to you would be, you know, what is his legacy as a bass player as far as innovation is concerned what did he bring to the table as a bass player because you can point to a lot of other great bass players in rock you can point to jack bruce you can point to john entwistle you can point to a lot of the studio musicians and as paul has mentioned many times james jamerson the motown guy as he often refers to him you can tell he was influenced by him if you listen to a lot of the motown lines you can hear some of that in paul's own bass playing what did he do specifically that was innovative other than the fact that you know the bass was mixed up hotter which had already had been done on american records what would you say is is his legacy as a bass player and, and why people revere him in, in, as far as uh, specifically for that instrument i think that uh, john lennon said that uh paul mccartney was a great bass player and that people to this there's mccartney's bass playing in all of them to this day, uh, Sting has said the same thing. All the great, a lot of the great bass players point to him as the one that inspired them. And I would go back to the playing on the White Album, the recording of the bass on the White Album. It's hard to specify in words exactly what it is, but if you listen to the sound of how the bass playing is on the White Album, more than Sgt. Pepper, I think that particular style is in bass playing to this day. Uh, the other guys you mentioned, Jack Bruce was a real hero of mine. Uh, he sure had a lot of people that copied him. John Entwistle and Chris Squire, uh, that progressive rock bass style hmm. used by a lot of bass players. That style has kind of come and gone. I love Chris Squire. It's almost too bad. But uh, McCartney's style is still there. I think if you listen to bass players from today and then go back and listen to the White Album, you'll hear a lot of similar styles. Does that answer that pretty well? I'm just trying to figure out, you know, if you can kind of explain, point out a specific song and his bass playing and how that's similar to what bass players are playing today, stylistically. Uh, I'm just, let's I'm go just... to While My Guitar Gently Weeps. Uh, it's, it wasn't the case a lot in those days that the uh, bass would be that punchy. So I would encourage everyone to put that song on and listen just to the bass part. It's very punchy. It rings. It's not round, round strings, but it, the the bass line rings and sounds really good. The the song punches, the bass part punches through the song, and uh, gives it a life that I that I think another bass player would not have given that song. It's a great song, and George Harrison did one of his best songs there, but McCartney gave him a bass bass line that really worked. It's a, a punchy style. It's done with a pick instead of fingers. Most bass players and if I'm not mistaken, most bass players through the 60s used their fingers. A lot of people, the guitar players, turn bass players, like McCartney used the pick. And it's a punchy, rhythmic pick style that uh, lifts, lifts a song. That's, I think that's the best way I can explain it, that song. Is it as much the sound and the tone of the bass, or is it more the bass lines yes. that, he, that, he, that he writes? I think it's more the sound and the tone that you mentioned there first, that people are using now that the, the bass lines were all so different from each other it's hard to pick one that's really influential 
But I point to that album as the uh, most influential bass album, maybe for rock of all time. Hmm. A you know, I, I've been true, but I think it's true. Yeah, there are times when I've heard the bass line in Taxman or something similar to that in other songs. So I think that's one of the most influential, me personally. Oh, an awesome bass part. It's, it's kind of distorted. Sounds like almost like he's playing through a Marshall <laughs> amplifier, hmm. which would be more distorted. Uh, yeah, the Taxman's bass part is great. So you actually all think... All the playing on Taxman is, uh, is uh, really well done, well played together. Yeah. Steve? Well, if you, as, Kent Nass, if you as a bass player had to sum up McCartney's style in a nutshell, what would you? how would you describe it? I would say that he was the the guy who, who I'm going to go out on a limb here, I'm going to say that he's the guy who invented uh, rock bass playing, not rock and roll, but rock bass playing. It's at times uh, very creative, you know, leaping around the neck to make a song breathe and fly, but then there's also uh, his bass playing on I Will, which is him humming bass parts, boom, boom, like that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Just a perfect little hummed part, and it's nice in its simplicity. He does whatever makes a song work, and that's that's one of his. Uh, that's a tribute to him. I've often heard yeah. that you know a lot of people appreciate what Paul does as a bass player because his bass lines are so melodic, and also he goes in different directions melodically than you would expect to. And and the case in point, because Paul has brought this up as a matter of pride is um, he'll talk about Michelle and the fact that as uh, the melody line in, in, in the song is going up, the bass line is going down. And he'd like to use that approach in something like Blackbird, which he later did for his song Jenny Wren. It was a similar technique. He liked doing those things. And he also learned from Brian Wilson, especially from listening to Pet Sounds, not to always go with the, the root of the chord and to go in a different direction or stay on a certain note that may not be the root of the chord, even as chords change. So those kind of things, I think, were very unique to him. Um, I have played the bass somewhat, Dennis, i got to tell you that. And one of the things that I love about uh-huh. Paul's bass playing and his bass parts is that very often as the chords change, he'll stay on the same bass note. And that kind of thing is something that I find really unique about some certain songs, like Fool on the Hill. Fool on the Hill starts out in the key of D, and, he, and, and the bass stays on D, but then the next chord is E, and the bass is still on D. And he'll do that kind of thing, which which adds another dimension to the sound. And I like that a lot about him. Did the same thing kind of with um, uh, Get on the Right Thing, which is on Red Rose Speedway. The bass note is the same note, even as the chords change. So I think that's something very unique that Paul brought as a bass player and in bass lines. Do you agree? Yeah, I do agree with that. And what a tension. That brings a lot of tension to a... Tension in a good way to a song. You know, the chords are trying to move up, but that bass is staying down there, you know. And uh, you may not even notice, the average listener might not notice that the bass is causing this tension, but it, it sure does. It's, it's a big thing that he learned, I think, around 66 or so, and uh, used it for uh, kind of power within a song. Well done. Hmm. But he was always trying to do something other than the norm. I mean, the the typical thing would just be to play the root of the chord or play a note that was part of the chord, but he didn't always do that. I think uh, the names, these guys that you mentioned earlier, Jack Bruce and John Entwistle, uh, they both came into prominence in 1966 in England, and they were very uh, experimental bass players, of course. And I think McCartney uh, caught wind of that and said, oh, bass is going in a new direction now. It's time for me to... Uh, Change, change things. So I think that he was very experimental based on what was happening around him in the, in the London scene. But I also think that with Beatles recordings, very often, it's like you can hum George's guitar solos. You can also hear in your head Paul's bass lines. So he created very memorable lines, which you know is a gift right there, which obviously the, yeah. the purpose of a bass is also to anchor the song. So I think that uh, that's where he really excelled there. And true, good point. And I think I've heard some people say that he was doing lead bass, say on Paperback Writer, and I disagree. I think that, as you say, he was anchoring the song, but his bass playing was really memorable. So he was able to do both, which isn't an easy task. Well, he came from being a lead guitarist to some degree, 
and an all-round instrumentalist to being the bass player. So there has to be some element of lead guitar in his work. He probably thinks in terms of, of a lead guitar line when he does a bass line sometimes, if he works at the bass. That may be. I'm not sure of any instances where that sounds, he sounds like a lead bass player other than maybe all that stuff and I want you, that great kind of flying around that he does there would might be indicative of a, a lead guitar style. But what about when, when he's he's copying the other lead guitar player, like on Drive My Car? Oh, right. It's, uh, I think that's a bass line that the guitar player, you know, I think it was George's idea to do that. But that seems more to me more like a, if I may beg to differ, a bass line with, with the guitar doubling on top. And that's an effect I've always loved, the bass doing one line and the guitar an octave up, you know, higher but playing the same notes. It's a good effect. Now, dig a I pony. love driving my car, and the same thing with uh, Hey Bulldog. He's following the, you know, the piano guitar line. Yeah, I think Dig a Pony is like that. Yeah, same thing. I am. Well, I, I have to say, I played bass bass guitar for probably about, I don't know, fifteen minutes maybe. Because <laughs> the one time I was actually, the one time I was actually in a band, they had me, they put me on bass, and and. Uh, I never got to gig with them, unfortunately. But, uh, but I mean, obviously, when I was playing, I was thinking about Paul's style. Um, but, uh, and unfortunately, for anybody anybody wanting to know, there are no recordings of my group, so can't be bootlegged. Oh, I'm sorry. We're gonna find them though. Be, I mean, it would be really interesting if somebody found something, but there, we it was never recorded. But. I'll anyway, find I mean, you know, you can't. I mean, his recording, his work has just been so, uh, you know, at the forefront of what everybody, you know, everybody's looked at, up to him, and it's and it's really kind of interesting. That you know, like Ken said, you know, he was not originally, he didn't really originally want the gig. You know, it, they, it was kind of push, it was kind of pushed on him, and and he really, I mean, it was like, you know. I don't know if you want to call it God's will, but I mean, there were there was something working there that uh, that made it work, and uh, thank God they they went that route. Thank God they asked him to do it. Well, Paul, it's, has... it's interesting to me. Uh, yeah, Steve, it's interesting that there are so many sub stories in the early days of the Beatles. That's one of them. That just little things happened that caused the Beatles to become what they were. Uh, the last day of Brian Epstein looking for the recording contract. Just incredible stories that had not, they not worked out the way they did, uh, our lives would have been completely different. I think that's right safe to say. Yeah, um, it's, it's you know the stuff that that Lewis and some of the stuff that Lewis and, uh, mentioned. I mean, it's just amazing. It's absolutely amazing. So, all right. Anyway. Well, Dennis, it's been great having you here on the show. And we wish you much success with the new book, which, again, is called The Beatles and Their Revolutionary Bass Player. And you also have a website that people can go to. Isn't that right? Yeah, I have two. Actually, it's on Amazon.com. But also, if I could spell it out, uh, DennisAllstrand.com, D-E-N-N-I-S-A-L-S-T-R-A-N-D.com. And for... I'm honored that a lot of people want a, a signed copy, and I was kind of surprised. If anyone does want a signed copy, uh, that is that is where you would go order it. And uh, There's a lot more information in that book than just the bass plane. I want to remind everybody. It's uh, just a lot of information in there. It's the kind of book you can pick up and open up to any page and hopefully enjoy it. And you know there's even a quote in there from this, this Beatles DJ oh. na- named Ken Michaels. I don't know who it he sure is. is. Yeah. He talks about one of the... There's a quote from you about about uh, Within You, Without You. That's right. But also there's a quote from Ken Scott that was uh, borrowed with your permission from your uh, your radio show. Oh, sure. Ken Scott, engineer on the White Album. I'm more than happy to, to let people use my interviews. That's on the website with my permission. That's all. So uh, okay. Ken Scott, by the way, I just met him for the first time a couple of days ago because I attended a, a listening session for the Beatles mono box set. Such a really nice guy, and I only had a couple of minutes to spend with him, but um, he he was a blast there. He was part of a panel to talk about these recordings, and I just had to ask him the question, why there were so many differences between the mono and the stereo? And um, he basically said that even though the Beatles 
really and truly only listen to the mono recordings through through the White Album, the stereo mixes were pretty much done in a hurry, and there were a lot of mistakes made. So it wasn't as if there were a lot of artistic decisions to be made between the mono and the stereo. A lot of it was just done very quickly, and, and that's why they turned out the way they were. So, right. <laughs> you know, you, you can you can bang listen. your head against the wall with all these different versions, and from me to you doesn't have the... The, the harmonica at the end on the mono version, and why is that and when it's on the stereo version? They're all, you know, according to Ken, they were pretty much mistakes that were made. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's interesting because I've, I've always enjoyed the mono versions more myself. Uh, Lady Madonna being the, the best example, very powerful song in stereo, not so much. Hmm. Well, you know, it, I've been brought up on the stereo mixes most of my life. And I would never preach to people to tell them what to listen to and what not to listen to. But I do think that if this was the way the Beatles listened to the music, we should at least give it our consideration and listen to it that way. I'm not saying you have to you have to prefer it that way, but at least hear it the way that that they intended it for us to to hear it. Right. So you, you two got you two got to listen to uh, like a presentation of the the mono mixes that are coming out. I did. Uh, I he got did. to hear I, it. I, I, they did not have one of those in my uh, up here uh, in San Francisco, unfortunately. They're having. Uh, they're actually having one. Of, great. They're having one next week in L.A. Yeah, I know they are. Yeah, I, I've heard about that. Yeah. So I would try and go to that if I were you, but I know it's it's not. San Francisco and Los Angeles are not as close as I thought they were. <laughs> no, they are not. <laughs> yeah, after you, you finally drove down there, didn't you? Yeah, I learned, you know, just by my own experience. That's the thing yeah. when you're on the East Coast and you think it, about California. You're a Giants, Giants fan, the, the the distance is more than just uh, miles too. You know, most true. that's that's also true. <laughs> um, but I, I I I have been to Dodger Stadium a couple of times, so and survived. Sorry, LA, LA fans. <laughs> I know there's some people from LA listening. They're probably going. They're probably grumbling right now. But okay, whatever. Yeah, they're, they're probably saying we're in first place. Where are you guys? You know? Yeah, I know. that's right. <laughs> All right, we anyway. got to wrap things up here. So, Dennis, thanks so much for joining us. And uh, as I said, good luck with the book, The Beatles and Their Revolutionary Bass Player. It's been great having you. And um, thanks for being here. Uh, Steve and Ken, thank you very much. I could I could talk about them all day. I sure appreciate you letting me on your show. Thank you, thank you, Dennis. All right, that has been fun talking to Dennis Alstrand. I'm Ken Michaels, thanking you for joining us here on Things We Said Today, and I'll see you next time. And this is Steve Marinucci saying, Dennis, thank you for for being on the show, and we will see you all next time.